Welcome to TalkCast and to an unusual, out of the ordinary episode today. What I'm going to do is provide a summary and analysis of Ayn Rand's objectivist epistemology. And I'm going directly to her book, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. Now, I do spend time critiquing other kinds of epistemology, in particular, something called Bayesian epistemology, when I can find it, (laughs) and when I think it has a prominent place somewhere and it's worth doing so. For example, in the works of Steven Pinker, Steven Pinker tries to explain rationality to a broad audience, so he has great reach and therefore great influence. So sometimes I think it's actually worth my while to do (laughs) something of the form of a public service to try to unpack some of those misconceptions. And of course, it gives me an opportunity to explain what I think is, is the better theory of epistemology. Well, let's be honest. The best theory of epistemology, epistemology, what is known about how knowledge is created, period. And I'm also on David Deutsch's side here when he explains that in, for example, the fabric of reality, his purpose there was to explain our deepest fundamental theories of reality. No one has enough time in their day to go around putting out all the spot fires of misconceptions that are everywhere. Because error is everywhere. Error is ubiquitous. So it's very, very hard to counter all of the false things that are out there. In the case of false epistemologies, there's false folk epistemology, there's Bayesianism, and there's a number of others. And well, Ayn Rand has an epistemology. Now, there's a few reasons to counter what Ayn Rand has to say or to explain what she's trying to get at in her epistemology and why it is worthy of critique. One reason is that I think the broad philosophy of objectivism can be incorporated into a worldview, broadly speaking, with Popperian epistemology as the epistemology of that worldview. Ayn Rand was a great defender of freedom, personal freedom, personal responsibility, that you are in charge of your life and you need to make the most of your life. Great, important message. That economic systems and human flourishing is best facilitated by non-coercive means. That we can all rise in wealth and power by freely trading with one another by minimising the role of government in our life and government coercion in our life. So in that sense, I'm very much on her side. The problem is that the epistemology doesn't move beyond basically what the ancients gave us. She has a very Euclidean view of epistemology, believing that one must begin with axioms and using rules of inference, logical rules of inference, one arrives at conclusions knowledge, and that those axioms are arrived at by some means of observation out there in the world, that you would derive the knowledge from external reality. In fact, for her, as we'll see today, we'll read a little part, and there's very little distance between epistemology and ontology. And in this way, she has a lot of difficulty grappling with error and fallibilism. In fact, it doesn't appear at all as a central part of her conception of what knowledge is or how it's constructed. This is a great flaw. And if your epistemology isn't able to account for flaws, errors that people make, the ubiquitous mistakes, that's a problem because it should be able to do that. Epistemology could also be regarded as the theory of errors, how it is that errors are created because all of our knowledge contains errors. That needs to be a part of epistemology, a part of understanding how it is we learn about the world. That we can, in fact, manage to scratch a little bit of truth out of reality, to learn just a little. But in doing so, we also reveal to ourselves all the ignorance we still have and how, indeed, some of the things that we knew were completely flawed, or at least flawed in part. Popper's epistemology accounts for all of this. Another difficulty is is that Rand herself writes that epistemology really is the deepest part of philosophy. I'm not sure if I agree with it there, even though my personal biggest interest in philosophy is epistemology. But whether it's the deepest, I don't know. This notion of having a deepest part of philosophy, I think, is misconceived, arising out of her conception of how knowledge is generated. So that's a problem. And I guess finally what I would say and why I'm making this 
sort of podcast today, whether or not it appears in the main feed or not, I'm, I'm yet to decide, is that Rand's followers are great allies in the fight against tyranny, authoritarianism, socialism, collectivism, uh, people being fed a message that they don't need to make much of their life, that don't worry, the government will look after you, this kind of thing that doesn't give people a desire to aspire to achieve and create and to be great out there in the world, to have an influence and to have an effect. We're being fed messages from elsewhere that you're a victim, that you're powerless anyway in the face of the difficulties that are before you, and Rand offers a different view. So I'm on her side, and I'm on the side of the people who follow in her footsteps and promote her message. The difficulty is they also insist that objectivist epistemology is correct. And they're very unwilling to move on this, not least because the epistemology says that the way in which you construct knowledge almost guarantees you've got the truth. So once you've got the truth, you kind of, there's no need to consider anything else outside of that. Now, not all objectivists are like this. Euron Brook speaks eloquently about how indeed you can improve your epistemology, you can improve on Rand. But he says that objectivism is the philosophy of Rand. And so he's a strong defender of objectivist epistemology. I think a very eloquent speaker. However, again, if the epistemology insinuates, suggests, implies that the reality, that reality out there, ontology, can actually be understood perfectly in some way, that what you're doing when you construct knowledge is actually get the truth now, it's going to be very hard to change someone's mind on anything, including the epistemology, because they believe they're in possession of the truth. After all, what does the epistemology call itself? Objectivist. It's objective. It's correct in some way. Well, they would think that, of course, under the Popperian framework, what we mean by objective is could be wrong. There's an objective way in which it could be wrong. And applying actual objective knowledge, which is critical rationalism, the actual concept of how we have knowledge out there in the world beyond minds, it says that one should expect to be wrong and misconceived. Just sometimes you don't know how. Well, here's a case where, indeed, it's wrong and misconceived. Popperians will be able to spot the errors, the fundamental flaws in objectivist epistemology. We'll read straight from Rand's own words on this in black and white, and indeed see it is a misconception. It is false. The claims it is making are just not possible. And I should also say at this point that the way Rand writes, her style of writing when it comes to epistemology is unclear, abstract philosophizing. And my deepest misconception here, apart from her lack of fallibility on the point, her, her lack of understanding how conjectures are formed and guesses are made in the world and refutations and all that Popperian stuff, my difficulty is the impenetrable style that she uses of philosophizing in the abstract disconnected from fields like science. Popper implored us to always begin with problems somewhere. Science is perhaps the preeminent example of this. You look at science and see how it's done. How is knowledge there constructed? He talked about the ancients and how they tried to construct knowledge and here were the problems in trying to construct knowledge there. He referred to things like the tension between different cosmologies, how Newtonian physics came about and comparing that to Einstein's general relativity and how these two things were incompatible, making incompatible claims, and yet they both represented knowledge of a kind, and how is that possible if they contradicted one another? All of that is answered within the Popperian framework, and he speaks about specific instances of how the epistemology works. He does this across his philosophy, by the way. It's a crucial, absolutely crucial, indispensable part of philosophy. Philosophizing in the abstract without referring to real-life examples out there in the history of ideas, you end up in a cul-de-sac of navel-gazing. You're, 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 you're considering things like, oh, how is this word defined? You fall into Wittgenstein's trap of reducing philosophy to just a debate about what words mean. That's not philosophy. Philosophy is about solving actual problems and creating actual philosophical knowledge, making progress, 
progress, mind you. And if you're defining things into existence, that this is the definition of that, this is what this must be, this is what this thing must be, necessarily. You have a closed system. This is a problem. It means it can't be improved. It means you think that there can be no error there. And Popper's entire philosophy is, a, is very much about error, the possible errors in his own philosophy and the errors that we're going to find everywhere else. And it's just this gradual correction of the errors that allows us to learn something, that there's the mistakes that we've made so far. Here are the ideas that work right now and therefore correspond to something in reality but they will still, those ideas that we have about that reality, the knowledge that we've constructed of that reality, we should still expect to be imperfect, incomplete, not quite right, misconceived in some way. And this is accounted for in Popperian epistemology, but not in objectivist epistemology. So without further ado, I've, I've spoken for over 10 minutes now as an introduction, so let me get into Rand's work, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. And as I say, the best we can do, the greatest respect we can show for any idea is to critique it. If I didn't care about Rand's epistemology, I wouldn't bother doing this. But I'm bothering to do this for any objectivists out there who want to understand why it is that the epistemology is flawed. You can keep the rest. Keep the stuff on capitalism. Keep the stuff on personal responsibility, on the virtue of selfishness and so on and so on. Great, wonderful stuff. But the epistemology is flawed. And in fact... More importantly, you don't need Rand's epistemology, Rand's very, very flawed, foundationally flawed epistemology, in order to keep the rest. Because there is an epistemology out there, the Popper, Popper's version of epistemology, augmented by David Deutsch, that will allow you to speak about these things in a far better way. Because it will be conjectural then, explanatory, and you yourself will be fallible in explaining this stuff. And so... You should be more willing to change your mind. Let's dive in. Her, her book contains eight chapters, and I'm definitely not going to read all of them, but it is a, it's a short piece, and then uh, and there's some material in there by other contributors, and uh, there's various other essays and that kind of thing. But I want to begin where Rand begins in trying to explain epistemology and to see where she goes wrong almost from the get-go. So there is a summary of, the, of what's to come, of the chapters to come in the book. Let's read a little bit of this just to get a taste, uh, because if you are someone who listens to TopCast, this will be jarring to you, as it is to me. So the summary begins. The first chapter is called Cognition and Measurement. And she writes, quote, The base of all man's knowledge is the perceptual level of awareness. It is in the form of percepts that man grasps the evidence of his senses and apprehends reality. The building block of man's knowledge is the concept of existent, which is implicit in every percept. The implicit concept existent goes under three stages of development in man's mind, entity, identity, unit. The ability to regard entities as units is man's distinctive method of cognition. A unit is an existent regarded as a separate member of a group of two or more similar members. Measurement is the identification of a quantitative relationship by means of a standard that serves as a unit. The purpose of measurement is to expand the range of man's knowledge beyond the directly perceivable concrete, end quote. So we've got a raft of errors here, just starting with the last one first. Directly perceivable concretes. Directly perceivable. What is directly perceivable? Now, let's consider, she uses very, very simple concepts. She talks about... You know, tables and cats and trees and that kind of thing. So, so apparently you can directly perceive the table. Well, can you? Or do you learn that? Do you learn that? Because a child encountering the world for the first time doesn't see tables. They just see objects. And they, they, they conjecture over time. You, you point at a table to a young child and you say, table. And they look and they, they don't have the language yet. But what's going through the child's mind? Is the child thinking, well, okay, table, thing up high. Does that mean the, the, the bookcase is also a table? Because the child's presumably just a toddler down on the ground or a baby, perhaps. What are they thinking about what you mean by table when they first encountered this word? Do they think object with four legs? In which case, chairs are also included. 
But then, of course, when you eventually point to a chair, then the child realises, well, chairs and tables must be different things. That's a chair, that's a table. Okay, so I'm ruling out that that thing, the chair, counts as a table. So what is a table? Well, maybe one day they're crawling around on the floor and they, they point up at Dad's desk that he works at and they say, table. And Dad goes, no, no, desk. This is a desk. This is a little bit different. And then now, they, now they're really a little bit confused. So what's the difference between a desk and a table? Maybe the, de- oh, the desk is where Dad works. The table's where we eat dinner. And so on it goes of this process of guessing what this word refers to and checking it against reality, in this case, what other people are telling the child. But this consideration of simple objects like this misses the point, really, of how knowledge is created, proper explanatory knowledge. What we're talking about there is how is word formation occurring? How can we get to directly perceivable concretes? Let's consider a real-life example, okay? Rather than this abstraction about this is why people make fun of philosophy by the way anyone who's not a philosopher they talk about things like this ricky gervais who did philosophy he would joke about the fact that you know you'd spend lecture after lecture talking specifically about something ridiculous like that like you know what is a table is this really a table do you know it's a table you you're knocking on it and you're saying table or not and, you know he felt like at the end he just wanted to pick one up and smash the table over everyone's head inside the lecture theater it's like there you go that's a table now you sh- now are you in any doubt <laughs> it was just kind of you know it's an understandable impulse <laughs> the frustration felt at talking about tables and simple objects let's talk about something more interesting You look up, and this is the one that the same story, but listeners to TalkCast will be bored at this point. But for any objectivist listening, you look up into the sky at night, and you see little pinpricks of light in the sky. And especially if you're with a child, and you you, you point at the sky, you say to the child, stars, you know, stars, look at those stars up there. What does the child think? Ah, little pinpricks of light, cold and dim, they're the stars. And so perhaps the next night, the, the child says, you know, mummy, daddy, can I go outside and we can look at the stars? And you say, yeah, sure. What are the, what are the stars? Do you know what stars are? And the, the child says, no, oh, they're tiny and they're cold and they're dim. And are they right about that? Now, on Rand's account, in some way, shape or form, they are, because are they not directly perceivable concretes in some way? The light that you're getting, which is all you have access to, by the way, even if you're looking at a table, well, this process of seeing involves nothing more than photons entering your retina. And then, by the way, you're not your retina. And so the, the retina has to then convert the photons into chemical signals, which then are converted into electrical signals, which end up being sent via the optic nerve back towards your brain as electrical crackles. But even the electrical crackles being your brain are not you and not thoughts. Thought is what's going on in your mind in some way, shape or form that we don't understand, but it's correlated with this brain activity. Okay. All of that's just to say that seeing itself, even something as simple as a table is a complicated theory laden process, as we say. But When you try to explain to the child, no, look, however old they happen to be when uh, this becomes an important question to them, that those objects in the sky called stars are not small, they're actually vast, huge spheres of hydrogen in the main. And they're not cold, but hot, among the hottest objects in the entire universe at the core, millions upon millions of degrees Celsius. And we know what's going on there. We know. Although light years away, we know that at the centre of those stars, the core of those stars are hydrogen nuclei, protons being smashed together to form helium. But we can't see those. No one will ever see that. The, 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 The theories of exactly how it is we come to that knowledge also tell us that it's literally impossible to put an instrument there, much less a person, to see what's going on directly in the core of those stars. Nothing can survive at that temperature. But we know what's happening there. We know what's happening there because of a chain of reasoning, but importantly, explanation, possibly misconceived, error-prone always, can be improved, but not derived for any particular observation. We're interpreting. We're not deriving. We're interpreting the light that we're receiving, scant amounts of light, by the way, and there's nothing, so nothing's directly perceived in that sense. We don't, we don't even directly perceive the light, as I say. <laughs> the light is striking the back of our retinas and being converted into electrical signals. Is that direct perception? doesn't sound like it. What is direct? We're minds. 
We don't have direct access to anything. We're stuck inside of our heads. <laughs> That's what's going on there. And by the way, if you do want to directly, or if you do want to perceive any of this stuff really in order to figure out the truth of the matter or closer to the truth, a more close to real description of reality, explanation of reality about what's going on inside of those stars, you need instrumentation. You need to put stuff between you and the star. Telescopes and spectroscopes to analyze the light. And then after, again, a huge chain of explanation of astrophysics and nuclear physics, you eventually come up with this idea that there are these complex nuclear fusion reactions going on many light years away in the core of that star, that thing that we call a star. Rand's epistemology cannot, cannot explain this. And one of the reasons is she doesn't begin with science. She doesn't begin with problems in science about how this happens. It's, it's this abstraction away from anything other than the language. She's focusing on the language, talking about what a measurement is. Ugh, that's a part of science, but it's not a crucial part of epistemology. The next chapter she summarizes, it's called Concept Formation. And again, you're going to hear that this is very, very abstract. This isn't explaining things clearly about how knowledge is constructed. So Concept Formation, she says, quote, Similarity is the relationship between two or more existents which possess the same characteristics, but in different measure or degree. The process of concept formation consists of mentally isolating two or more existents by means of their distinguishing characteristic and retaining this characteristic while omitting their particular measurements. On the principle that these measurements must exist in some quantity, may exist in any quantity, a concept is a mental integration of two or more units possessing the same distinguishing characteristics which their particular measurements are emitted, end quote. So this idea of unit is a fundamental constituent of an epistemology, of a piece of knowledge that cannot be further broken down. In other words, there's no explanation for it. It's just axiomatic. It's self-evident or something like that. In other words, on that particular point, you can't be mistaken. It's the foundation, the brick, out of which the rest of the edifice of knowledge under Rand's conception is going to be built. It's a platonic notion, justifying your beliefs in some way. How can they be justified? By recourse to explaining whatever the bit of knowledge you have is in terms of things that were justified earlier until you get to bedrock, epistemological bedrock. Almost every other epistemology speaks in this way. They, 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 they need a foundation. They need the, the thing that you start with that's indivisible that you can't be mistaken about. And therefore, you can't, because you can't be mistaken about it, you get to knowledge, which is truth. This is truth in some way by this process of logical derivation or induction, as of, as of course, Rand actually supports this notion of induction. She endorses this idea of induction, which we know Popper completely refuted and showed was... Uh, completely superfluous to the project of knowledge creation. Okay, so I'll begin reading a little bit from Rand's own words on this. It's important to notice that these things exist in historical context. She wasn't a great fan of Immanuel Kant, nor am I. And so what she was trying to do was to escape from the vision of epistemology that Kant had, quite rightly. Uh, he distinguished between analytic and synthetic things and thought that there was a, a neat division that you could make between these two things. Now, never mind what that is, but she didn't realise that, well, there's another way to go, namely conjectural knowledge, in order to navigate the waters of how knowledge is actually created. So I'm not going to worry about concerning myself with a critique of Immanuel Kant's work. So in her section, her chapter called Concept Formation, she writes, a quote, a concept is a mental integration of two or more units which are isolated according to a specific characteristic and united by a specific definition. The units involved may be any aspect of reality, entities, attributes, actions, qualities, relationships, etc. They may be perceptual concretes or other earlier formed concepts. The act of isolation involved is a process of abstraction, i.e. a selective mental focus that takes out or separates a certain aspect of reality from all others, e.g. isolates a certain attribute from the entities possessing it, or a certain action from the entities performing it, etc. The uniting involved is not a mere sum, but an integration, i.e. a blending of the units into a single new mental entity, which is used thereafter as a single unit of thought, which can be broken into its component units whenever required." End quote. So 
there is a kind of correct idea here to steel man the position that you're going from reality to abstract ideas. Yeah, absolutely. This is what, you know, Papyrian epistemology would say, and I think most people who engage in epistemology would agree with is that you have objective reality out there and somehow or other you have to go to this abstraction. This abstraction being the knowledge itself. The knowledge itself is a form of representation of reality. But of course, where the units come from in Rand's view is the problem with this. Because the problem is that her epistemology would have it that there are these fundamental units that you directly perceive, that they're the absolute truth. And then integrating these things, once you've got these different units, you can put them together. As she said there, it's not summing them together. It's not just adding them together. It's integrating them together in some way, shape or form. And then you get the knowledge. And then the knowledge, of course, has in a sense been derived from these more fundamental units, which themselves are derived from reality. And this is why she thinks it's objectivist, okay? Because you're just talking about reality. So long as this process of integration is correct in some way, how we guarantee it's correct, on the other hand, is, 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 is anyone's guess. Now, the next paragraph really gets to the crux of the matter, where it comes down to Rand not being too much different from Wittgenstein in her approach to philosophy here. And so in that sense, I'm afraid to say, she's a standard philosopher that needs to be lumped in with all those other philosophers that aren't Popper, <laughs> to be honest. And specifically, yeah, well, let me just explain. She writes, quote, In order to be used as a single unit, the enormous sum integrated by a concept has to be given the form of a single specific perceptual concrete, which will differentiate it from all other concretes and from all other concepts. This is the function performed by language. Language is a code of visual auditory symbols that serves the psycho-epistemological function of converting concepts into the mental equivalent of concretes. Language is the exclusive domain and tool of concepts. Every word we use, with the exception of proper names, is a symbol that denotes a concept, i.e. that stands for an unlimited number of concretes of a certain kind, end quote. So there we have it. Very early on in her discussion of epistemology, she's placing language and words front and centre that really the problems of epistemology, the problems in epistemology, the problem of explaining how knowledge is created is a problem of how to understand a language. This, of course, is going to leave out the overwhelming majority of knowledge that people have. Knowledge that people have is inexplicit, not expressed in language. So immediately you're cutting yourself off from all the stuff that we know. <laughs> I know how to ride a bike, but I don't know how to put it all into words perfectly. After all, if we knew how to put into words how it is that people ride bikes, then all you would need to do is to take a perfectly competent English speaker almost perfectly competent, who didn't know how to ride a bike and explain it to them with words. But that's not what happens. The words almost provide no help whatsoever. A person who cannot speak can learn how to ride a bike. They don't need to put it into words. They don't even need to put it into words to themselves. There's all sorts of things that people know. You know famously, people talk about women knowing what childbirth feels like, but they can't explain it. They know it's painful, but merely explaining it doesn't give men an idea of what childbirth really feels like. There's all sorts of stuff we know, even the stuff we can put into words. Some of it, the explanations of the things that we put into words, can't themselves be put into words. Because you, you get to a point where you're just relying on definitions or you're moving in certain... All definitions are either, are either circular or lead to some kind of infinite regress. Ultimately, they're circular. But if you focus your epistemology on language, problems of language, problems of how to define words, define words, then you're divorcing yourself from the way knowledge out there in the real objective world is actually being constructed right now. Explanations and progress is being made and how stuff improves and so on and so forth. It's not, just an integrated, it's not just an integration of concepts. We're, we're discovering new things all the time, and we're having to invent words for those new things that we discover, often for problems that we have. And if you go down this road of thinking that epistemology in some way reduces 
or a foundational problem within epistemology is how words are defined, then you, you, you leave out science. You leave out history and even politics and, and how problems arise in those areas which can have epistemological, philosophical solutions. And instead, the examples that you're going to deploy in order to illustrate your epistemology are going to be about you know, how we define things like table. <laughs> <laughs> rather than, you know, how is it that Einstein came up with the theory of general relativity? What, what was going on there? What was the process that led Darwin to come up with evolution by natural selection? You, you need to start there in problems. How is this knowledge being constructed? How are these explanations being arrived at? What's the process that's going on there? And does that process have analogues elsewhere? Or is it indeed identical to what is being done in history economics, people's personal lives, every other domain. Science is used by Karl Popper as a case study because it is so neat and crisp and it allows you to just say, well, it works there. Clearly it works everywhere else as well. This idea of conjecturing, going out into the world and testing those conjectures against reality, that's what works everywhere. It's the only way that knowledge can be produced, created, actually brought into being by a creative human being. But Rand is kind of getting there with this idea of abstraction, but never really moves beyond just how words are being defined. She goes on to say, quote, Words transform concepts into mental entities. Definitions provide them with identity. Words without definitions are not language, but inarticulate sounds. We shall discuss definitions later and at length. <laughs> the above is a general description of the nature of concepts as products of certain mental processes. But the question of epistemology is, what precisely is the nature of that process? To what precisely do concepts refer in reality? End quote. Kind of? The central question of epistemology is, is yes, knowledge creation. So I think she kind of gets that right. The nature of that process, what is that process? A particular mental concept that the, the the products of a certain mental process. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, that's explanatory knowledge. But of course, we know that there's knowledge in, let's say, DNA, the knowledge of how to build certain organisms. But, but she needs to focus on a certain kind of mental process. I mean, that, even that is a poor way of explaining what's going on. Well, I just say uh, the central question of epistemology is about knowledge. It's got something to do with knowledge, how knowledge is created. That's what epistemology is about. How does this thing called knowledge actually arise in the world? Even if you think it's only about mental processes, name the thing. Name the thing. I'm, not, I'm barely seeing here this word knowledge actually appearing in this part of her discussion of epistemology. Just talking about concepts, concept formation. The next part is very, very telling. So let's see what kind of example she draws on in order to illustrate her points. Again, consider Popper. What, what, what does Popper do? Popper goes straight to historic problems in, let's say, geometry, what the nature of number is. You know, he talked about uh, Plato's view of number and, and what problems he was working on at the time, what problems Galileo and Kepler and Newton and Einstein had, how different versions of atomic theory were arrived at, specifics, times in history, places and people, and that's why his philosophy is so rich when it comes to epistemology, because he's, he's telling you, look, here, here's the historical event. You know, you go to Popper's work, you go to, to, to almost any one of his works, you know, Realism and the Aim of Science or something like that. And he never stops talking about these guys and what they were doing. Kepler, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, Goldbach. <laughs> he talks about specific people. People working in physics and biology and geology and mathematics and what they were doing. And as a case study, it's like, what's going on here? How are they actually doing what they're doing? What problems did they have? How did they overcome them? What was the process of coming up with these ideas and then dismissing certain ideas but retaining others and then having the overturning of ideas? How can this be explained, especially how could this be explained in traditional conceptions like Rand's where you're just perceiving reality or observing reality, if that's what you're doing and, and, and your senses can be trusted in some way, I'll provide you with reliable knowledge, how could you come to different conclusions, wildly different conclusions, by the way? The process is not reliable. Why isn't it? Why are we error-prone? There's no focus on errors and being error-prone 
in Rand's epistemology. It's about how we get to truth rather than how we correct errors. This is why Popper's epistemology works, because we can talk about truth absolutely. We can talk about objectivity, but only because we're able to remove falsehoods from the world, remove error from the world by having these problems. What are the problems? Well, problem is a lack of explanation, a lack of knowing something. And, and in order to create that knowledge, you have to conjecture. But the conjecture is going to be faulty and flawed in some ways. But you don't know how ahead of time. It's not deductive. And you're not inducing it from the observations that you make of reality. So what, what Rand goes on to say is, quote, Let us now examine the process of forming the simplest concept, the concept of a single attribute. Chronologically, this is not the first concept that a child would grasp, but it's the simplest one epistemologically. For instance, the concept of length. If a child considers a match, a pencil and a stick, he observes that length is the attribute they have in common, but their specific lengths differ. The difference is one of measurement. In order to form the concept length, the child's mind retains the attribute and omits its particular measurements. Or more precisely, if the process were identified in words, it would consist of the following. Length must exist in some quantity, but may exist in any quantity. I shall identify as length that attribute of any existent possessing it, which can be quantitatively related to a unit of length without specifying the quantity. The child does not think in such words. He has, as yet, no knowledge of words, but that is the nature of the process which his mind performs wordlessly, and that is the principle which his mind follows when having grasped the concept length by observing the three objects, he uses it to identify the attribute of length in a piece of string, a ribbon, a belt, a corridor, or a street, end quote. This is abstract philosophizing without being connected to reality. Here's the problem. We don't actually know what the process is that goes on inside the mind of a child. She's trying to get down to some bedrock here, and yet this very idea is itself a conjecture that is untestable, that we don't know how exactly children without words, infants, are forming knowledge. It must be, this is why we must stop in place, why we must start with problems in places where we can actually talk sensibly about this stuff. We don't have access to someone's brain, their internal mind, especially prior to when they can speak. We do have access to something like science and the history of science and the history of ideas as case studies to look at stuff. And then you start there because however knowledge is being created there is how knowledge is created, period. So we can talk sensibly about that because we can actually argue backwards and forwards, refuting each other with specific arguments and observations we can make about the history of ideas. Talking about what's going on inside the mind of a child is a misdirection. Uh, she can just assert whatever she likes. Here's my assertion. The child is conjecturing reality, as I said earlier. They're guessing at what's going on, possibly at concrete objects. The very problem with saying that they're starting with something like a concept like length is you're diving straight into the abstract. This is not the concrete. I very much doubt that this is one of the first concepts that the child learns at all, at all. You might want to talk to a child psychologist. I don't know that children are actually able to distinguish between things of different length. Piaget talked about this, among others, that it's not abstract concept formation that happens first at all when you look at the development of a child. When you actually understand what is going on with babies and infants. The, the hierarchy of ways in which children build their knowledge, create knowledge, is perhaps to begin with simple objects to actually begin. If you want to talk in Rand's terms, to talk about, yeah, table. Okay, table is this thing. Bed is this thing. Mum, mum is that thing. You know, the, the first word is usually mum, right? Mum. And so, mum or dad. And so, they've developed an idea that this object there is mum. Right? So there's no concept of length and height and width. Whether or not they have that, who knows? Who knows? We don't know. In other words, we have no good explanation. But Rand is only imagining this into existence, and perhaps she can't imagine more than this, alternative possibilities to this. But as I say, I think it's concrete objects. Now, I can't prove that either. She thinks it's abstract concepts, like length. Why <laughs> length of all things? That the, the, the child doesn't have a word for length but understands length? 
I don't know about that. This, this, this is abstract philosophizing. We need to bring it into the real world of actual problems. And I would say in science, just as Popper does. Now, let's talk about what Newton was doing when he came up with calculus, or what he was doing when he came up with the inverse square law for gravitation. What's actually happening there? How, what, did this, what did this process involve? What problems was he solving? You know, you had people like Ptolemy, the ancient Greek, m mapping the movement of celestial bodies across the sky. He noticed planets there. He had a problem because these things called planets, these wanderers in the sky, weren't obeying the usual rules that went on with all the other objects in the sky, namely the stars at night, which all did the same kind of motion, but the planets didn't. And so came up with this idea of, well, geocentrism. The Earth is at the centre, and then these other things are in the solar system, but they're moving around the Earth, and this is why you're getting this strange motion. But he couldn't properly account for it. And so later on, you had Copernicus come along and say, well, maybe the sun's at the centre. This can help to explain this. And then Galileo came along and Kepler, and they were saying, well, you know, maybe it's not perfect circles, but, but, but ellipses that these things are moving in. Maybe that will explain the motions a little bit better. So it's, it's these problems. They're each guessing at a slightly different version of the previous theory. The previous theory had something going for it. It, it explained something, but it wasn't always right. So they improved on it. How? By refuting what went before, adding something to it, doing, making observations, ruling stuff out. This is true for grand theories of science and physics and cosmology, all the way down to how people, individual people, must be generating knowledge. After all, those guys were independent, were individual people. And Newton was an individual mind creating knowledge at a very high level, explanatory high level knowledge. But he was doing it ever since he was a child. And it was the same process. He used the same process to figure out the inverse square law of gravitation by considering a particular problem, among other things, the motion of planets across the sky, as well as objects falling towards the Earth, okay? There's these very complex high-level problems. He used that process, whatever that process was going on, yeah, sure, in his mind, but which could then be written down and transmitted to other people via paper and various other means. That process was the same process that he used to form the very earliest ideas that he had as a child, as an infant, as a baby. And again, what was that process? Coming up with the idea. How? By creating it. How? We don't know. If we knew we could program, computers could do, to do that, but we can't. It's this special feature that people have of generating explanatory knowledge. But we know we do it. We, we conjecture explanations. We don't derive them from outside, they come from within us, and we compare them to the outside. It's cart before the horse to say that what we're doing is observing the world and getting the knowledge from the world. No, we're encountering a problem. We, we, we have an observation that just doesn't fit with our existing understanding of reality, and then we go about trying to conjecture new ideas. And in all of that stuff that I just explained about how, you know, Newton might have done what he did and, you know, how he followed Kepler and Galileo who were trying to fix problems with Ptolemy's ideas and this idea of constructing knowledge. I'm not talking about words and language and definitions and concept formation and identity and this very, very abstract removed from reality philosophizing that Ayn Rand is doing here. What she's doing is very, very subjectivist. It's very, very focused on how a mind might work. But we don't have access to the mind. This is the problem. And she's assuming that this is what happens, that, you know, you're a, we're trying to figure out how this concept of length. Length is a high-level abstract idea, very abstract. She goes on to say, quote, The same principle directs the process of forming concepts of entities. For instance, the concept table. The child's mind isolates two or more tables from other objects by focusing on their distinctive characteristic, their shape. He observes that their shapes vary but one characteristic in common, a flat level surface and supports. He forms the concept of table by retaining the characteristic and omitting all particular measurements, not only the measurements of shape but of all the other characteristics of tables, many of which he is not aware of at the time, end quote. No, no, that is just... Pure speculation, and I think it's completely false too, by the way. A child, when learning language, and this is again, we're, we're removing ourselves from philosophy. We're here talking about how people learn language and learn words. 
which, yeah, okay, it's got something to do with knowledge creation. But it's so hard to talk about because we don't have access to the mind of an infant child. We can't interrogate them about what's going on. How are you doing that? Because they lack the language. But we can talk about adults who are forming complex theories. We can actually see the process. It's been written down at length. And we know the history of ideas, what must have gone on. And if we've got questions, we can look at problems right now in science and to see how those problems are solved and where unsolved problems exist. This is the where knowledge is being created right now in an obvious way. And this is why genuine epistemology talks about that and why Popper talks about that. He talked about his contemporaries trying to create knowledge at the time because it's a nice, clean, neat way. It doesn't mean that he was able to solve the problems of uh, that they were having, that those scientists were having, for example, with quantum theory, to understand what was going on there. You know, he, he had the wrong idea, but at least he was focused on what they were doing about trying to come up with explanations. This is where epistemology needs to begin in science, or at least in some other subject where we're constructing knowledge, theories, explanations, not this stuff about what's going on inside the mind of a child. We don't know what's going on inside the mind of a child exactly, but I can say right now that this is wrong. This is going to be wrong. What she said there is that the child's mind isolates two or more tables from other objects by focusing on their distinctive characteristic, their shape. End quote. Really? Is she sure about that? How, I don't know. Like, a baby is looking around the room and seeing stuff. Now, is it the shape? Do, do tables come in a thousand and one different shapes. Some are circles. Some are high. Some are low. Some can sit on your lap. You know, the stable table type things. Are desks tables? Maybe. It is, I think it will be very hard early on for the child to distinguish between what a table is and what isn't a table. Coffee tables and dining tables and desks and tables, that's bedside tables, these things are all tables. We know as adults, eventually having learned all these things are tables. You know, your bedside test of drawers is sometimes called a bedside table, but it's got drawers in it. So how is that a table? This, this way of doing philosophy and epistemology is bankrupt because we don't know exactly how it happens. So starting there is a really bad way to build up the rest of your epistemology because you're in the realm of pure speculation, unable to be tested and unable to be refuted. Well, I'm refuting it now, but what I'm saying is they can just stand back the objectivists can stand back and just insist. They can just be dogmatic and say, no, this is how it happens. And I can say, no, it doesn't. And no one's going to make any progress because there is no way of making progress. I can't interrogate the mind of a pre-verbal child and say, how is it that you're eliminating objects out there in the universe that aren't tables from ones that are? What are you doing? I've got no access to that. Her vision of epistemology, we, we can't, we, we, there's no way of critiquing it. There's no way of having a sensible debate about it. And so she, she says some more. Let me just pick it up and then I'm going to skip to the, the next part. She says, quote, The first words a child learns are words denoting visual objects. And he retains his first concepts visually. Observe that the visual form he gives them is reduced to those essentials, which distinguish the particular kind of entities from all others. For instance, the universal type of a child's drawing of man in the form of an oval for the torso, a circle for the head, four sticks for the extremities, etc. Such drawings are a visual record of the process of abstraction and concept formation in a mind's transition from the perceptual level to the full vocabulary of the conceptual level. End quote. How does she know? How does she know? This again is this realm of pure speculation. A child might very well be drawing in that way, not because that's what they think a person looks like, but because they simply don't yet have the dexterity of hand, the skill, the knowledge of how to draw better. They, they, they know what a person looks like by looking, I would say, just as well as an adult does, but they haven't learnt yet how to represent arms and legs. But Rand is kind of saying, that, oh, you know, what they see is just these sticks as arms. And that these are a visual record of the process of abstraction and concept format. I don't think they are. I don't think they are. Who knows what it means? She's presuming to be able to get in the mind of a child. This is why it's not objective knowledge. This is not objectivist. This is subjectivist. We are completely in the realm of the mind and, and debating about the concepts of the mind, a debate which cannot be settled by interrogating the people we're talking about. Because 
by our own definition, they're not verbal yet. This is why we need to begin the epistemology in a place where we can talk about sensibly what's going on and we can interrogate the people involved, the scientists and so on, insofar as we need to, or at least interrogate from a distance from their writings and from the process well historically documented about what went on, what problems Newton and Kepler and Galileo were solving, what, what problems Darwin was engaged in, how it is, what he did physically in order to do what he did. And once we've got that understanding of how knowledge is created in science, it, it's a very small leap to say, well, this is how knowledge is created in history. It's a very small leap to say, well, this is how knowledge is created in, in morality and in politics and mathematics and everywhere else. This is what's going on. It's human minds that do it, so therefore this is how human minds construct knowledge. That gives us a little bit more of an insight about what's going on in those minds, if you start that way, because we can talk about all that stuff. And so therefore, by necessity, this is how all people, which includes children, actually create knowledge via this process of conjecture, where they're fallible in doing so, but it's that, that creating explanations about the world, generating explanations, even as children, even as children, they're doing that. And then they're correcting misconceptions as they go along. It may very well be that children begin with complex, inexplicit explanations of the world. They have an understanding of cause and effect in a way. And that's how it begins, rather than this concept formation that is a highly derivative thing that comes later. That eventually they figure out an explanation, not a definition, an explanation of what a table is. A table is this object that functions in a certain way. It's got nothing to do with shape. It's not about shape. I don't think it's about shape at all. That it's about a table is used to put stuff on. That's what you use a table for. And we can separate it out from all other objects that exist throughout the house. Things like chairs. That's what you sit on. But you don't sit on a table. That's a plausible story. Nothing to do with the shape of the thing. After all, if it's to do with the shape, then what shape? Is it a rectangle or a circle? You know, some modern houses might have triangular tables glass tables uh, uh, i've seen tables and my parents have had a table before that 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 is very misshapen made of very natural wood piece of oak that's sort of you know uh, uh, bits and pieces out of it shape is a very poor way of forming a concept of what a table is rand is i would say categorically wrong about this fundamentally foundationally wrong about this and that a child more than likely forms an explanation of certain objects in their environment that explanation might not be in words, or it might be, but it might not be. But they have an understanding, ah, that's where, not in so many words, but that's where you put the stuff. The stuff goes on the table. And that's what separates tables from other things, more than anything else. A table's where you sit, where the chairs go. There's usually chairs associated with tables. You move towards the table and you're near the table. You don't spend as much time around a chest of drawers, let's say, as what you do a table. But there are certain things that are chest of drawers that are also kind of like tables because you put things on them. But that big box over there out of which we get the cold stuff, the fridge, there's not much on that. So that doesn't count as a table. A bench is kind of like a table, but you don't have chairs around it quite often. But sometimes you do. But it doesn't seem to count as a table because it's connected physically to the wall. You know, these are the kind of explanations, I imagine, that a child would come up with. And then eventually has the word that they can put onto all these things and goes, aha, all those things that have that in common, that's a table. But it comes down to an explanation. The explanation tells you what they have in common. It's not just listing these elemental things, these units, as Rand would have. It's all a problem with, from the ground up, <laughs> excuse the pun, with Rand's philosophy and epistemology in this particular case, of trying to treat epistemology as a process of, resembling something going on in mathematics. We need to begin with axioms using rules of inference and you get to these higher order things, theorems, or in her case, concepts. So it's been nearly an hour and I've been through, you know, she doesn't get much beyond talking about language. This is how she thinks concepts are formed. And we've seen that that's flawed, foundationally flawed. Even when she comes to talking about things like mathematics, you know, she uses trope examples, like, you know, two plus two and so on. But it's all about words. It's not about problems. It's not about explanations. It's not genuinely about knowledge. You know, the, the, the word knowledge does appear throughout this, but not very often. It's not, not front and centre, but that is the concern of epistemology. The central concern of epistemology is knowledge. Okay, I'm skipping a, a fair bit. 
I'm not re- as I say, I'm not reading the entirety of this before. I've read it before. I found it dry, uninspiring, and uninformative. Especially when you've read Popper and you did the clarity of the writing there, to my mind. I know some people struggle with Popper, but all you have to do is to put Popper up against any other philosopher. And you'll realise there's a black and white difference in terms of how clear and commonsensical the writing is. It's, it's not like normal philosophy. It's not this use of jargon and use of abstracted examples. Let me just read another little bit of what Rand has to say here and, the, we'll, and we'll give up on it for now. I, I need to speak to an objectivist, have a conversation with them. Uh, in order to have the ideas encounter one another, Papyrian epistemology and Ayn Rand's objectivist epistemology. As I say, a supporter of Rand when it comes to other areas of her philosophy, which I do not think depend upon this, uh, her defence of capitalism, for example, goes to the history, drawing examples from history about how this stuff works. Why she can't do that with epistemology, I don't know. Well, I do know. She, she seems to be ignorant of science, She's not grounded in science, so to speak. Uh, Words probably misused. But at least Popper, throughout all of his work, it's example after example. The the instances of where the the actual epistemology of his is shown to operate. But what we get from Rand is, let me read another short passage. She writes, quote, this is, you know, a little bit further on from concept formation. Quote, Man's particular type of consciousness is the distinguishing characteristic by which a child at a certain level of his development differentiates him from all other entities. By observing the similarities among cat, dog, horse, bird, and by differentiating them from other entities, he integrates them into the wider concept animal and later includes man in this wider concept. The definition of animal in general terms would be a living entity possessing the faculties of consciousness and locomotion, end quote. Well, I mean, how many problems... Can we fit into a single paragraph there? Firstly, she's attributing consciousness to all animals. So that's what her definition of an animal is. How does she know? How does she know? Locomotion? I don't think so. You know, some animals don't move. What about a paralyzed person, a quadriplegic person? Something like that. They're not going to move. Or a person with locked-in syndrome. It doesn't have anything to do with that. There are, what an animal is is what biology tells us animals are. That's it. Okay, now the the old high school definition of certain characteristics, no, it's it's down to genetics these days. So this is wrong. This is wrong. But also, it's all about observing the similarities, she says, among cat and dog. So you you start, again, you start with, it's it's inductivist. In order to figure out what a cat is, well, you observe the similarities between the cats. Uh, There's cat number one, there's, there's thing number one, thing number two, thing number three, thing number four. All those things are cats, therefore all things that are like that are therefore cats. So it could be furry and has claws and so on and so forth. It's very inductivist. This is how concept formation works under Rand. She can't escape from induction. She doesn't know, she can't think of anything beyond induction, doesn't realise this is a solution to induction, that you don't just have deduction and induction, observing particulars in order to form a, a general universal thing. This is not how we understand what animals are. I, I, I dispute the fact that children form concepts in this way, that first you build up particular examples and then you have this overarching umbrella thing, animal. Maybe they begin with animal and maybe they recognise that animal is anything out there in the world that isn't a person, by the way, because we rarely refer to people as animals. I think there's a good argument that you know people these days should be considered as something other than animals, that we've got this word animal, but we're a third kind of thing. There's plant, well, third, <laughs> I say third, but if you're going to say you're going to divide things you normally see out there that are alive, plants and animals, okay, you've got bacteria as well and archaea, <laughs> fungi. <laughs> I would say people don't really belong to that. People are people. We're separate again. Okay, we have a lot in common with animals, but then again, our animals have a lot in common with trees, don't they? You know, not everything. There's a crucial difference between plants and animals. Well, I would say there's a crucial difference between people and all other animals, one of which very well might be consciousness. We don't know what consciousness is, but she's attributing it to all animals there. Why? I don't know. But she's right to say man's particular type of consciousness is a distinguishing characteristic by which a child differentiates him from all other entities. I'm, I'm on her page. I'm on her side there. I happen to think consciousness may very well be intimately tied to the capacity to generate 
explanatory knowledge, in which case, if it is, if I'm right about that, then she's wrong <laughs> that all other animals have it. Because I agree with her that it's the distinguishing characteristic that allows a child to do this mental stuff, to do this knowledge formation stuff. Other animals don't have that, though. So why she's saying she's conflating two things there? Indeed, she goes on to say, quote, man's distinguishing characteristic, his rational faculty, is omitted from the definition of animal on the principle that an animal must possess some type of consciousness but may possess any of the types characterising the various units subsumed under the new concept. End quote. I don't know what that means. Okay, so she's saying, well, they've got some sort of consciousness but not this sort of consciousness. <laughs> no, that doesn't really help. That doesn't really help with anything. Maybe someone else is able to explain Rand better, has taken Rand further, can understand what she's saying, takes it out of the abstract. Euron Brook does a wonderful job of explaining Ayn Rand, but tends to avoid detailed exploration of the epistemology. And I think there's an important reason for that. There's so many problems with this. that It's just root and branch wrong when it comes to trying to understand how it is that people create knowledge and how it is that people create errors. After all, if it was anything like Rand says, that you're observing reality in some way, you're just getting the knowledge from reality, deriving it, then wherefore mistakes? How is it that we, that we make errors? Why are people fallible? And if they are fallible, which they are, then how do we get knowledge? Which presumably is in some way derived from ontological reality which doesn't contain errors. Now, Popper can account for this. Popper explains how it is that we're just guessing at reality. The function of observation there is not for us to derive knowledge from reality, but to distinguish between our guesses, which can be, make incompatible claims about reality. Because observation is theory-laden, and it can be, it can, it's unreliable. It can produce terrible errors. Okay, so there is... And there are a number of other people out there who try to explain Rand's work. So I'm going to just pick one, a, 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 a scholar of Rand of a kind. Okay, there are, there are more famous, prominent people who do this, but I'll, I'll just pick one fellow's work. And in the next podcast, I'm going to go through his work. I'm going to explain one of his essays. It's a short essay, relatively straightforward to, to, to get through. Okay, I won't get through the entire thing. Um, but just for the benefit of objectivists, to see what an objectivist who's very passionate about Rand and who thinks Rand got it right, then tries to put Rand's epistemology in their own words. So we've looked at Rand today, and I think we've found that it doesn't reach a standard of clarity that might be found in much of our other writing, that this stuff on epistemology is confused and it resembles what the ancients were saying. It's very similar to, to Plato's view, that you're just getting to these beliefs about the world. She's calling it concept formation, which she means knowledge, but isn't able to explain what's really going on and just has avoided, completely avoided problems in science, how knowledge is constructed there, because that's the way you really need to go. So this isn't adding anything. If anything, it is um, more confusing. It doesn't contain an explanation of the explanation. It doesn't contain an account of knowledge, what knowledge really is, as useful information, as information that once instantiated somewhere in a physical substrate, tends to cause itself to remain so, tends to get copied. And the stuff that solves the problem, the solution, the information that solves the problem that you have. That's what knowledge is all about. How does that happen? Well, that's what Popper talks about. And objective knowledge is knowledge that need not exist in minds. They can exist out there in objects. We've talked about that before. Okay, but until I engage with this other objectivist, other objectivist writing, until then, bye-bye.